Hello, everyone, and welcome to Live Through Jesus with Courtney Gilmore. On this episode, A Visible God, Obedience, and Idols. Exodus 32, The Golden Calf. Now, just as a quick side note, I'll be reading all the scripture references for you, so you're free to just sit back, listen, and absorb, or you can grab your Bible and read along. Most of the time, I'll be reading from the New King James Version, but if I switch, I'll let you know. At the beginning of each episode, I'll introduce the title, so if you want the entire study in writing, you can go to livethroughjesus.com and buy it for under $5. Each one will cover two to three months' worth of episodes, and once you buy, then it'll be immediately available for download. In addition to a little extra studying, it also allows you the benefit of some charts and keyword definitions, but it isn't necessary. Okay, so let's get started. Before we get started, I just want to let you know that I'm almost finished with the written study, so I'll let you know whenever it's on the website to purchase. Now, last week we read Exodus 24, and this is where the people made a covenant with God. God gave them the Ten Commandments and several other instructions that Moses wrote down in the book of the covenant and read to the people, and the people all agreed to obey these things that the Lord had told them to do. And so they sacrificed animals and were reconciled to the Lord. Then after that, several of the elders and Moses went up on the mountain and had a meal with the Lord. And so if you missed that episode, you might want to go back and listen to it because we talked about our own salvation and how we make our own covenant with God to allow him to be the Lord of our lives and accept Jesus as our Savior and how that just brings us into a fellowship relationship with him like the elders had on the mountain. So if you know God already and he is your Savior and Lord, It's still good for us to remember all that God has done for us and look at how it was done in the Old Testament and how that relates to us today. And if you haven't done that, definitely go back and listen to that episode because salvation and a relationship with God is completely laid out in that episode. Now, after the elders had this meal with God, then Moses went further on the mountain and spoke with God and all of the things that God talked with him about can be found in chapters 25 all the way to chapter 31. But we're going to study all of that in a separate study. And so we're going to be reading chapter 32 today. I want to continue with the narrative of Moses and the people and not get hung up on the laws and the building of the tabernacle and those things. So let's go ahead and read Exodus 32 So it says, Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off your golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool, and made a molded calf. Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings, and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to play. Okay, now we're also going to skip over before we even begin talking about this and read in Deuteronomy 9, 9 to 15. In the book of Deuteronomy, the people are about to go into the promised land and Moses is recounting basically the story of Israel up to that point to the people before they enter the promised land. And so this is his account of what happened with the golden calf. This is Moses speaking. When I went up into the mountain and received the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant which the Lord had made with you, then I stayed on the mountain forty days and forty nights. I neither ate bread or drank water. Then the Lord delivered me two tablets of stone written with the finger of God, and on them were the words which the Lord had spoken to you on the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. 
And it came to pass at the end of the forty days and forty nights that the Lord gave me two tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant. Then the Lord said to me, Arise, go down quickly from here, for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have acted corruptly. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them, and they have made themselves a golden image. Furthermore, the Lord spoke to me, saying, I have seen this people, and indeed they are a stiff-necked people. Let me alone that I might destroy them and blot their name out from under heaven, and I will make you a nation mightier and greater than they. So I turned and came down from the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire, and the two tablets of the covenant were in my two hands. Okay, so remember that the people were too afraid to hear the voice of God directly, and so they were relying on Moses to be the voice of God. And so when he ascended this mountain to get the instructions from God and then doesn't return for over a month, the people are completely confused and don't know what to do. They obviously don't know what happened to him. And, you know, a lot of people think that they were just being impatient and couldn't wait on Moses anymore. So they had to ask for another God to lead them. But I honestly do not think that's the case. I think that they genuinely just didn't know what had happened to Moses. And if you realize in Deuteronomy, it said that he didn't eat or drink for the entire 40 days that he was there. And the people must have known that. The people must have known that he didn't have enough food and water to drink for that amount of time. And we know that God supernaturally was making it where he could go without water for that long because nobody can go without water for that long. But it would make sense for the people to think, you know, he didn't have enough food and water to stay up there that long. He probably died of starvation. Also, you have to realize that they were terrified of God. They didn't even want to hear his voice again, much less meet with him. And so they very well could have thought, you know, what if Moses did something to make God mad and God killed him? you know. And so to me, it makes good sense that they are completely confused and probably just wondering, is Moses ever coming back? And so it's obvious that they are wondering, you know, we don't know when this guy's ever coming back, even if he is. And they were not allowed to even touch the mountains. So they couldn't go up and look for Moses because if they did, then God would kill them. So to me, it makes good sense that they were confused and didn't know what to do. The problem is not that they were confused and didn't know what was going on with Moses and didn't quite understand. The problem is how they reacted to that. Also in Deuteronomy, it tells us that the mountain was still burning with the fire of God's glory whenever Moses came down with the tablets in his hand. And so they should have known that God was still meeting with Moses on top of the mountain because they could see the presence of God in that glory cloud. They knew what that meant, but they wanted a more visible God than that right? That's why they asked Aaron to make them a God to go before them because they wanted a God that was visible like the other people had. Moses was the only representation that they had of God and God's only voice, and he's not here anymore. So they needed something visible. And, you know, to be honest, I think sometimes we're tempted to want a visible God too. You know, we want someone that we can see and we can hear and there are just times in our life where God feels far away. That's how it was for these people. If they thought about it, they knew God was with them because they could see his glory cloud, but he was far away. They couldn't hear his voice. They didn't have the leader that was speaking to him and, and knew what was going on. And if he felt too far away from them. And a lot of times we can't hear God's voice. We don't feel his presence. But the Israelites knew that God was real. They didn't need a visible God in order to know he was real. They had already seen his power in the plagues, in the parting of the sea, in his leading in the wilderness. They knew he was real and they should not have needed a visible God. And it's the same with us. We can see the effects of him even if he isn't visible or audible to us. You know, we can see his power all around, all the things that God has done. And if we don't have our own testimony yet of God showing his power in our own lives, then we have the testimony of others that we trust that can tell us, you know, these are the things that God has done in my life that I know it's him and no one else. 
And also the Bible gives proof of him, even if we don't have that personal testimony of ourselves. And so he is always present, even if we choose to stand afar off like the Israelites did because they were afraid of him. I want to read you a couple of verses. The first one is found in Hebrews 11, 1 through 3. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things that are visible. Also it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, Walk by faith, not by sight. And so these people in the congregation, they were simple enough on their own without the help of Aaron, right? Because they had just been given the Ten Commandments like a month before. And they vowed to obey those. And already they're contemplating breaking the first three of them in just a month. We didn't read the Ten Commandments because I told you that I wanted to go over those in a different lesson, but I did tell you to scan those, and I may have even touched on each one out loud with y'all. I can't remember, but I'm going to read you the first three right now because they broke the first three commandments by building this calf. The first one says, you shall have no other gods before me. So, I mean, obviously they were making a God instead of the Lord God. You shall make no carved image for yourself. So that one's pretty explicit, right? They definitely did that. They definitely broke the second commandment. And then the third commandment is not taking the name of the Lord your God in vain. And they did that by calling this thing their God that had brought them out of Egypt. They were using God's name to refer to this inanimate object. So they were contemplating breaking the first three commandments just by asking Aaron. But then Aaron he quickly failed also, right? Because he was left as the leader in Moses's place and he was not leading the people. When the people approached him, you know, he should have reassured them that Moses is going to come back. God and him are still meeting because look at that glory cloud. It's still there. God's still with him. He didn't die. He's going to come back down. But even if he didn't put those two things together, He should have at least, at the very least, right, known that they didn't need to do what they were asking. Even if Aaron didn't know what to do, he didn't know when Moses was coming back, he didn't know the answer to what would happen if he didn't come back, all of that, he should have known what not to do because God explicitly told them. It was only 10 commands and they had promised to obey them. So Aaron should have said no I'm not going to make you a God that will go before you because you already have a God and he told you specifically not to put any gods before him, not to make a carved image for yourselves. And so I'm not going to do that. But instead, of course, he led them in the sin. Not only did he just sit by and let them make an idol for themselves, he made it for them, instructed them as to how to do it taught them in their sin, basically. And most likely this gold that he asked for was the gold that God had given the people through the Egyptians whenever they left because he told them, you know, they'll have favor on you and give you their gold. So that's most likely the gold that they had that they're using now to do this. Now, we already talked about how we can relate to the people, but we can also relate to Aaron. Because it's hard to be strong when other people are weak. And it's hard to meet their doubt with faith, right? Whenever someone comes to you and they're doubting, they're confused, it's hard to say, I know that this doesn't make sense. I don't have all the answers either. But you just have to have faith that everything is going to work out. It's difficult to tell someone that. It's also difficult to combat someone's feelings with facts, right? Because we don't want to seem uncaring. When someone is genuinely worried or concerned or sad or angry or whatever, it's difficult to tell them the truth in love because they don't want to hear the truth, right? They want to hear you validate their feelings a lot of times. And so that's a difficult thing to do. And it's also hard to stand up for the right thing whenever you're the only one standing up, you know? You know that this is wrong, but you don't want to be the only one. 
You don't want to be the person that says, um, wait, I don't think we need to be doing this whenever everybody else is like, hey, let's do this, even whenever you know it's wrong. These are just hard things. You know, we don't want to seem bossy. We don't want to seem judgmental. We don't want to seem self-righteous. And so it's tempting to just keep our mouths shut, let them do whatever they want to do and agree with them and whatever, just so we don't have to deal with that uncomfortable situation or upset someone that we care about. But the job of a leader is to tell other people the right thing to do whenever they don't know themselves, right? That's the whole purpose. If you knew what to do, you wouldn't need somebody else to lead you. And so that was Aaron's job. And that's also our job if we are leading others is to show them the right way. Also, even if we are not a leader, it is the job of every Christian, all of our responsibility, not to join other people in their sin and definitely not instruct them in it, right? And even in not joining them, if it is at all possible, we should encourage other people to take a different path. We should be strong enough and know God's word well enough to be able to say, I'm not sure what the answer is. We're just going to have to go on faith right now. I just know what the answer isn't. I know what God tells us not to do. And so we can't do that. And I know some other things that God tells us to do. So let's at least do those things that we know to do, not do the things we know we're not supposed to do. And Have faith that God cares about us and he's taking care of us. That's really all we can do. And that would be the most loving, caring thing for us to do with our friends. But it's going to take, you know, strong faith on our part and a lot of boldness because it is difficult. The way that we can do this is we have to be diligent to learn God's word. We cannot tell people what God says about their situation if we don't know. And we have to recognize his power in our lives, in the lives of the people in the Bible, in the lives of others around us, we have to recognize his power and bring him our weaknesses and let him help us and encourage other people to do the same. It's not an easy thing to do, but it is the right thing to do. Listen to these verses. The first one found in Psalm 138.3. This would be a good one to memorize. It's not very long. It's not all that difficult. And It'd be something to recall back to ourselves whenever we need to hear these words. Psalm 138.3 says, In the day when I cried out, you answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. So if we need boldness, if we need to be strong and stand up for what's right, then ask God. It says he will answer us in that. He will make us bold and give our soul strength. Listen to what it says in 2 Peter 1, 5. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to your virtue knowledge. So we have to be diligent to add to our faith virtue and knowledge. If we don't know the Lord, then it's going to be difficult at times to have enough faith to do what we're supposed to do. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. This is Paul speaking, and he says, The Lord said to him, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And so after the Lord told him that, he said, Therefore, most gladly I will boast in my infirmities, that the power of Christ might rest on me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, my reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, and in distress, For Christ's sake, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. So we have to rely on God, know that his grace is sufficient for us, and he is made strong when we are weak. So if we are having a hard time doing the right thing, bring that to God. Go to him and say, I know what I'm supposed to do, but it is hard. I am weak right now, and I need you to give me strength. And that is whenever God's strength shows through in our lives. Okay, and then the last thing that I want to touch on today is that apparently these people really believed that they were still worshiping God through this golden calf because Aaron told them that this is the God that brought them out of Egypt. And then they built an altar in front of it and they sacrificed the same burnt and peace offerings that they did with Moses, you know, a little over a month ago. 
and they ate a feast to the Lord. And so they had been influenced by other religions and they had began to mix their practices of worship with the practices of the other religions and they didn't even realize it because every other religion has visible gods that they worship. They had pulled that into their worship of the Lord and thought that they were still worshiping God. And so the practical implication for us today, I think, is... You know, worshiping an inanimate object and thinking that it has any kind of supernatural power probably doesn't make any sense to you because that's not something that anyone does today. But has Christianity been influenced in some other way by other religions or by the culture that we live in today? You know, they were being influenced by other religions and other cultures and bringing that into their worship with God and calling it true Christianity. And so do we do that? Do we bring in things from this world or other religions and think that we're doing what God is wanting us to do? Is it possible that we've mixed the practices of the world into our churches and performed some sort of perverted gospel that we don't even realize? I want to propose to you several things that I thought of that I believe may be us doing this type of thing. What about whenever we try to fit our understanding of the Bible into the new scientific or worldview of this time instead of examining those views to see if they fit with the word of truth, right? Because God's word is true. And so instead of looking at what science says or looking at what the world says is okay today, things like that. Instead of looking at those things and saying, do those things that everyone is saying today, do those things line up with what the Bible says? Because I know what the Bible says is true. Or do we take what the world says and try to fit it into God's words, meshing the two, mixing them together, making both of them right somehow. Making the new scientific idea, it's like, oh yeah, um, God, that's probably what he meant whenever he said this, or he didn't really speak quite to that, so that's probably true. Taking ideas that the world says, oh yeah, this is okay, God doesn't mind that, and we look and we're like, yeah, he probably fine with that, because you know, right here he says this, but you know, he probably meant this or that trying to fit the world into this Bible the way we understand it and make it all make sense instead of taking this Bible and saying, "Um, no, we need to correct a couple of those things that the world's saying because that's contrary to God's word. We cannot mix the views and ideas of this world with God's and say that it's God's truth. We have to weigh them and see, does this make sense? Is what the world is saying, is that lining up with the word of God? So I think that's one way. Another way, do we pervert the gospel by making the gospel all about ourselves? Making it about the created instead of making it about God, who's the creator. You know, a lot of times our worship is focused on what God can do for us and not what we can do for him. And so my question would be, Who are we worshiping in that case? If it's all about, oh, God is so good because he does this and this and this and this and this, and we just love all of these things. And those are all true. But if it's not turned back around and say, and therefore we should do all of these things, then it's about us. It's about what God can do for us. And that is what makes us twist things to make things work for us. Because we say things like, Oh, well, God wouldn't want me to be unhappy, so it's okay if I do this. Or God knows this is how I am and this is what I want, and so he's fine with it. It's all about us at that point. It has nothing to do with worshiping God. Okay, now I'm going to say another thing that may be a little controversial. I don't know, but I believe it to be true. What are we doing whenever we try to attract people to the church with entertainment instead of with the gospel? Do we sometimes look at the things of this world and say, oh, the world likes this. And so I'm going to incorporate that into the church because we know that they like this. And so if we do this in the church, then it's going to draw them here. 
on the surface, that sounds good because it sounds like, well, whatever gets them there, right? We just want people to come to church. And then when we get them there, we can tell them about the gospel. But here's the thing. Since when did the news of a savior for our sin, when did that become not good enough, right? Because the word gospel means good news. And the good news is that the heavenly father, our creator, loved us so much that he sent his son to pay the price for our sins so that we can live eternally with him. And so there's literally no better news that a person can receive than that. If we just look past this very moment and into our future and find out that we can live with God forever in heaven because of what Jesus has done and not be separated from him and not live in eternity of hell, then there's no better news than that. And so how can we possibly think that there's something more appealing than that, more attractive than just God, Jesus, our Savior? Why do we need more than that? And why do we expect to draw people to God with the things of this world? If we're drawing people to God by the things of this world, then we're not drawing them to God. We're drawing them to the world. And we're just using God's name to do it. Since when is Jesus not enough? That's the question. And the thing is, is that the church is supposed to be a gathering of believers. We're not supposed to be expecting that our pastors and our Sunday school teachers are the ones that are going to tell people about God. And so we just have to, you know, get them there so that they can learn about it. No, that's not the way it is. It should be where we are out in the world telling people about God. And they are so excited about the things that we're telling them that they want to go to church and hear more. It's supposed to be that whenever people see us out in the world, our lives are so radically different than the rest of the people in the world that others look at us and they say, I want that. I want what she has. I want joy in the midst of pain. I want peace in the midst of turmoil. I want love for people that are unlovable and people can look at us and see that. And they ask, how do you have joy in this situation? How do you have peace? How do you love them? And then you're able to say, because of God, because of Jesus. And that is the lure. The fact that the church has something to offer them that the world can't, that is the church's attraction. If we just make the church exactly like the world, then the church is nothing better than what they've already got. What's the point of that? The church is not supposed to be giving them the things that the world already gives them. That's not satisfying enough. The world cannot satisfy the things that we need. And so the church is the good news that says Jesus satisfies those things. The things that you're not finding in the world, you can come here. And you can find satisfaction. That's what the church is supposed to be. If we try to take the things out of this world and place them in the church to lure people in, we are not giving them the good news. We are not giving them the gospel of Jesus. We're trying to mix the things of this world with the church and call it Christianity. So can you think of other examples in the church? What about you personally? Are you serving and worshiping God alone or are you pulling in things from this world and then calling it Christianity? Something that all of us need to be thinking about because these people here truly believed that they were worshiping God when they were worshiping this idol. And that's not a position that we want to be in ourselves. Listen to what it says in Jeremiah 23 at the end of verse 36. For every man's word will be his oracle. For you have perverted the words of the living God, the Lord of hosts, our God. So that's what we do not want to do. Pervert the words of the living God. We want to tell the truth and the whole truth that's in this Bible. And so a lot of times people say, we just want to tell them the good things and not tell them the bad things like hell and punishment and sin, because those words are bad and they hurt people's feelings. And we don't want to tell them those things. And this is saying that is a perverted version of the gospel because we're not telling all the words of the Lord God. God talks about those things, about sin. And how is Jesus 
the Savior good news if they do not know that they have sin in their life that needs a Savior. We have to tell the whole word of God. Listen to what it says in Romans one twenty five. We have exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Whenever we make Christianity about ourselves, then we've begun to worship the creature rather than the creator. Romans 8, 5 through 8 says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity with God, For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh can't please God. The church, again, is supposed to be set apart from the things of this world. And so we can't take the things of this world, bring them into the church, and then expect people to have a spiritual mind instead of a fleshly mind whenever we're presenting with the things of the flesh. Galatians 1, 6, and 7. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the peace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. So Paul's talking to the Galatian church here and he says, you know, I can't believe you turned away from him so soon. You're preaching a different gospel. You've gotten away from the truth. You need to get yourselves back on track. That's what the Israelites did, right? They vowed to keep all the Ten Commandments and then it wasn't even a month and they had already turned away so soon. Last one. Listen to what it says in Philippians 3.3. 3. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. The things of the Spirit are the things that draw you to the Spirit, not the things of the flesh. So we are done for today. We're not going to continue reading the rest of this chapter. We'll do that next week. Just throughout this next week, I want you to be thinking about not needing a visible God because we do have visible evidence of his presence around us. Look for those things. Look for things that grow your faith, that remind you of God's power and the things that you know he can do. Ask other people. And then know the word of God so that you can be strong, so that you can stand on it. Don't allow yourself to be swayed into doing things that you know are contrary to God. And then be the encourager for others. Stand up, be strong and be bold and say, you know, I don't know the answer, but I know it's not this. The word of God specifically says not to do this. Don't be like Aaron and go along with things. And then I just think we probably all need to examine a little bit of our walk with God and see, are we serving and worshiping only God or are we pulling the things of this world into our walk with the Lord and then calling it Christianity? Not saying that we're not Christians and that we don't believe in the Lord, but have we gotten a little off? And is our leadership a little off where we're drawing people in in a way that we shouldn't be? So let's think about those things this week. And then next week, we will read the rest of chapter 32 in Exodus. So make sure that you subscribe so you don't miss that episode. Leave me comments wherever you're listening. Leave me a five-star review. That helps to get the word out. And then if you'd like to email me, my email address is Courtney at livethroughjesus.com. Thanks and have a good day. Thank you.